Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Move Guides and the RAS Forum today for our webinar and the key takeaways from our joint survey and white paper on the next frontier of HR excellence. I'm very excited to introduce our speakers today, Bryn Herber, CEO of Move Guides, and David Enzer, founder of the RAS Forum. Bryn founded Move Guides in 2011 during her MBA at London Business School after experiencing the challenges of her own global relocations. Under her leadership, Move Guides has grown from an idea to an award-winning company working with the world's largest organizations around the world. David Enzer is an international HR professional with extensive experience in end-to-end -end mobility program management. He has worked in HR and mobility roles for and with Nokia, IBM, and Procter & Gamble. We will hold a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, and we encourage you to submit your questions by clicking in the dedicated section on your webinar window to the right. For your reference, the survey was conducted over the summer with 80 of the largest multinational organizations from around the world. Without further ado, I'd love to hand it over to our speakers. Thank you and enjoy our webinar. Hi, Claire. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think just a, a reflection from my side before we dive into the macroeconomic trends which are really driving mobility, um, as I see it, in the 21st century. Uh, again, uh, just to look back at the survey participants, I think something that really speaks for itself in the, in the research that we conducted together is that we got a very broad cross-section of a representation from all levels of an organization. Uh, from uh, a great variety of different aspects of the HR organization from compensation and benefits through to those in talent, talent acquisition um, uh, and also kind of uh, talent, other talent specialist functions uh, and also a very nice representation in terms of organizational size as we can see you know there were plenty of kind of SME so to speak um, uh, and also some very big global organizations in there so I think it's quite a robust and, and well-rounded uh, piece of research. If we could just skip on to the next um, slide please. Thank you. Um, this one really resonated with me. I think there's you know the, the three core macroeconomic trends that we sought to explore in the piece of research. Firstly, globalization of business and revenue, secondly, labor um, labor shortages and skill shortages, and thirdly, changes in in the fundamentals around why um, you know in the ways that employees work. I think just a couple of small observations from my side on the globalization piece, of course. Perhaps there are many people can remember the uh, the HSBC Bank uh, airport advertisements when you would walk on and off the airplane on the airbridge, uh, talking about how even the smallest of businesses is global, um, with the cost of a glass of orange juice shown in three or four different currencies. And that, for me, it still makes me smile now when I think very much that's certainly the way that the world is going. And I also think of... I suppose the drivers of globalization of business. Um, for those familiar with a US academic called Perlmutter writing in the 70s um, and a research paper called The Tortuous Evolution of Multinational Enterprises and EPRG, ethnocentricity, polycentricity, regiocentricity and geocentricity, I think more and more we see true geocentric organizations emerging which is really em embracing a, a global talent pool uh, as a key to business success. So for me, this, this geocentric approach to global business is very much the key driver of mobility, of course, in the 21st century. Uh, the second observation comes to the second point, the labor and skill shortages. Of course, there's the standard factors. There's, you know, aging populations, global migration, of course. That, um, uh, and I think something I saw, I saw an interesting statistic a few weeks back. 55% of world graduates uh, by, by 2020 will come out of three countries. Uh, the US, China and India and of course in terms of future talent pipeline that's going to fundamentally affect many organizations as they go around trying to recruit the world's hottest and brightest global talent of course. Uh, and lastly and I think very excitingly for me uh, the changes in the way that employees work. Um, for those who've been working for some time we see a, almost like a pendulum a balance of power swinging backwards and forwards between employer and employee uh, and in times as now where there are more jobs than people, um, I think the time of organizations dictating terms um, is over in terms of wanting to attract the, the best talent. We see startups, uh, startup organizations um, uh, with a keen hunger to grow competing 
uh, on a fairly equal level with with big global organizations with a very, very strong brand and I think that's very much a sign of the times and a sign of things to come and we also see other trends of course that are developing um, the insistence upon mixed leadership I think is a fascinating trend and a very welcome one uh, when you consider that countries like Ireland, Germany, Norway have all been introducing legislation to insist upon uh, gender balance or at least uh, certain gender quotas and percentages in senior executive and board level positions I think all of this fundamentally changes the way that we work uh, and, and more importantly perhaps the, the, the biggest point of all coming back to what I said about organizations no longer being able to dictate terms uh, if they want to attract the best talent is the concept of the digital nomad um, the location free worker um, I see this in my day job uh, quite often when you know we have an employee uh, from country A working for the benefit of country B but refusing in some ways to to move permanently to country B and instead wanting to work from country C I think is a fascinating trend and one that will continue to pose challenges for mobility organizations the world over for the next few years uh, if we could move on please now again part of the research was looking at five pillars of the 21st century organization um, and uh, <clears throat> the five pillars of success as we call them global reach development of a learning culture financial efficiency technology enablement and employee engagement um, I mean starting off with employee engagement specifically relating to mobility I see increasingly mobility moves from simply being a, a transactional process to also being a key element of a reward and recognition strategy for global organizations the promise of an international uh, a working career is, is a very strong pull particularly when you look to future generations and what they deem to be of importance to them in assessing who they wish to work for uh, but of course employee engagement goes far beyond that um, I think one interesting trend I see is very much around a demise of hierarchy people don't want to necessarily work in an organization where which is governed by job titles and strict rules and of course some of these are very much bound up in local cultures and, and how the culture versus the trend for employee engagement and the lack of hierarchy clash we'll see over uh, emerging over the next few years but I also see another key f uh, factor of employee engagement is really taking a much broader review a much broader view on uh, total reward and what I mean by total reward is is thinking about anything and everything that an employee regardless of where they come from uh, deems to be a value in the employment proposition for many this might be a title the titles remain very important to others of course for others it's, it's reward for some it's opportunity uh, for some it's strong leadership and for others it's very much around uh, an engagement and an emotional connection with an organization's strategy or an organization's culture first uh, and I think that's the point that we'll come back to perhaps uh, shortly on the technology enablement this is for me is um, I mean we're in an age demonstrating clearly the huge power of technology I think from my side from my experience um, uh, one of the benefits of the technological explosion that we're seeing at the moment is is how it can facilitate true collaboration more importantly collaboration and co-creation um, uh, uh, we see this in the trend of the emergence of internal social media it's not just about Facebook anymore you know Facebook is dead for many people um, but for example Yammer uh, and other technologies which really facilitate much more social interaction from employee groups around the world who, who normally wouldn't get to speak um, and along with that of course comes the inevitable focus uh, not just on automation of processes and efficiency but very much taking the consideration of uh, the user experience um, as we look towards HR automation uh, from a financial efficiency point of view um, I think increasingly no matter where you sit in an organization where you sit uh, geographically or where you sit from a functional perspective we see uh, increasingly a push for all employees uh, to, to well, basically aligning people to shareholder value and this of course goes for HR as well uh, we're not immune to this we should at all times be thinking of how what we do um, really feeds into shareholder value the global reach I touched upon before with my reference to the EPRG model and, and Perlmutter's research but when one takes the RAS forum as a, as, a, as a great example of this we're a very small uh, uh, organization um, we've grown from humble beginnings and, and now I would say that we're truly global we have you know regular presence regular initiatives in in more than 40 countries we've got 800 active members around the world and for me this is that constitutes gl true global reach and you don't have to be an enormous multinational organization to, to, to have that um, and finally really on this on this piece the the learning culture um, 
I think this is absolutely key when you consider that you know that the, the, the classic statistic of currently 95% of all learning is done in a formal basis um, but more shockingly uh, participants in that learning process tend to forget 50% of what they learned in the first hour after the training is concluded and I think we'll increasingly a shift, see a shift towards uh, people having a much more healthy mix when it comes to learning. Um, some statistics I saw were 70% of learning will be done on the job in future. 20% will come from peers, peer sharing, that's a prime example of what the IRS form very much uh, facilitates. Uh, and, and only 10% in future versus 95% previously, 10% in future will come from formal learning and I think this development of a learning culture is absolutely fundamental to organisational success in the future. Now, how important are the following talent trends to an organisation? And of course the comparison with how effective is an organisation at managing them. Uh, I must say I love this. Um, I think for me what was fascinating about the engagement and company culture, um, uh, there's the very famous uh, quotation I think from a man called Peter Drucker that said that uh, culture eats strategy before breakfast. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast I should say. I think that an organization will never achieve true employee engagement until they create an emotional connection between an organizational culture uh, and um, and the employees themselves and of course how does one do that well one can speculate but I think uh, for me culture comes from a number of things of course there's the emotional things that trigger that connection but there's also the, enga the, the engagement of employees in creating an organizational culture in the first place particularly uh, you know when you're talking about startup organizations but there are also those much bigger organizations that at some point realize that their culture is an unhealthy one and they have to then trigger that change and that's also a fascinating process to be involved in and one that I've experienced in my working career to date. I think the inclusion and diversity one is, is also fascinating. Um, I think it's about authenticity perhaps when, when we talk about inclusive, uh, an inclusive working culture and, and, and a diversity agenda and not just paying lip service because it's deemed to be the on-trend thing to be doing but, but this true authenticity perhaps doesn't come from from showing your affiliations with organizations promoting gender parity or, or you know um, multiple generations in the work phase or the LGBT agenda but I also think it comes back to this culture point again and, and very specifically creating truly non-judgmental uh, organization um, which offers uh, absolute equality of opportunity you know you could take the the diversity agenda far beyond gender and age or, or sexuality I mean consider mental health um, serious mental health conditions also deserve I think are also as relevant as, as those other factors when you're considering this in terms of organizational acceptance and particularly that area of not being judgmental um, of course again I acknowledge that for some of those aspects of diversity there may also be cultural heritage as a barrier to, to enabling this as an organization and, and time will tell if that can be truly successful um, I think for me the thing that struck me in terms of uh, deliver, developing a leadership pipeline is that in my experience often we find that HR policies don't necessarily match the aspirations in terms of developing that leadership pipeline. Um, I once worked for uh, a major US organization without mentioning any names that when it came to um, uh, women um, falling pregnant on international assignment they were sent home because it was deemed to be inconvenient to the organizational direction. Uh, yet I've seen other organizations increasingly shifting away from that towards one where um, you know we seek to we acknowledge that um, we want more female or mixed leadership I should say we want to develop a very healthy leadership pipeline uh, and therefore we want people to to very simply put we want women to be able to have babies on international assignment um, and then continue their experience afterwards because it will grow certainly loyalty to the organization and I think they have as much right as anyone else does to that kind of consideration um, and lastly this this point around sourcing from a global talent pool again I come back to um, Perlmutter and EPRG the G being geocentricity just to remind everyone now it's been proven that geocentric organizations actually translate into more successfully financial uh, more financially successful organizations um, and if that's the case then true geocentricity involves very much breaking down internal barriers within organizations often you know global groups still have walls within them in terms of you know there may be a, a set of companies reporting into a common holding 
um, organization. Uh, and for me, that, that, that still creates a sense of internal competition to truly be able to have an effective um, global talent pool to source future leaders from, then I think you have to break down some of those internal walls and really begin to get the organization playing, playing the same game. And of course, that's, that's a challenge for many of us. If we could move on, please. So, technology um, and, and the relative importance and effectiveness. Well, I think the first one, virtual meetings, very much speaks to my point around collaboration. Um, but I think there is something to, uh, it, it's also around organizational impact. Uh, one challenge I often see in organizations is that uh, the Ulrich model, uh, this kind of concept of uh, global COEs, regional satellites or delivery partners and then HR business partners is, in my personal opinion, uh, a little flawed because often I find that without a truly centralized and, and driven organization or set up organizational culture, the Ulrich model does not work and, and it doesn't provide the organizational impact that one would hope for. And I think when you look at technology and how virtual meetings and virtual networking groups has the power to change that and, and go that final mile beyond this classic Ulrich model setup, um, for me, that's the real leap forward in terms of technology supporting virtual meetings. Um, on the easy intuitive user interface piece, well for me this is absolutely key. User experience is, is, is fundamental to how technology is shaped and I think it's very easy to develop a business transactional process um, but I think uh, you need to come at it from different angles to see how people then respond in turn, different users respond in turn to the technology to which we're offered and also listen to the feedback. Uh, data analytics is of course key and again we see from the trend here that <clears throat> whilst uh, 53% of organizations that responded to the survey, uh, they, they note the importance of data analytics, only 6% of course rate the effectiveness and for me this is uh, telling in itself. For me I've always believed that technology or, or data tells a story and it, and it can also point, a, uh, point one in a direction and maybe organizations need to have a think about that and I'll come to that on the following slide. And lastly, remote working. Well for me this is extremely relevant. It's something that I face more and more and more in, the, in my day job and also something that the IRS Forum is engaged in working with organizations to really develop approaches for when it comes to, first of all, uh, how remote working changes an employment relationship. Um, thinking about how the concept of trust must come along with remote working. Uh, risk issues, of course. Um, traditional organizations were, who may be very risk averse when it comes to, for example, you know, employees working from home or working from a third location. An organizational culture that doesn't lose itself. I've seen organizations lose themselves in, 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 in remote working. They tried to roll it out badly and it didn't necessarily sit with the existing organizational culture and perhaps that links back to the trust point. Um, there are the in inevitable questions around corporate tax topics which need to be worked through of course and perhaps you know when a significant weight of organizations begin to explore remote working then there'll be perhaps more opportunities for, for organizations collectively to lobby against um, organizations that set tax legislation who knows that's future speculation but all of those points the employment uh, uh, or the contractual relationship the, the trust issues the risk the culture and the tax implications for me they are all the things that embody this future concept of, of digital nomad and then we come on the next slide to um, the two big statistics that jump out less than six percent of companies believe that they are highly effective in data analytics and 14 percent of companies uh, provide their employees with intuitive technology um, well, the way I see this on the data analytics point is, first of all, I think some organizations maybe struggle with what they understand or what they understand to be big data. Big data is, of course, the very explicit, the very clear information that one can gather from surveys and, and typical HR information systems and that kind of stuff. But it's also the metadata behind it, um, which can tell us enormous amounts and really help us to shape a story and an understanding and point in a direction when it comes to, of course, user experience and consumer preference. And maybe that's consumer, you know, when one is selling a product, but consumer may also be for HR when we're talking about the employees of an organization. Uh, and the 14%, I think, is also very telling, the, the intuitive technology. Uh, <clears throat> it brings me back to a discussion I was having with a team member just this afternoon uh, around how we view 
say a business transactional process in this case mobility now I, I use the analogy when when talking to my colleague about this of you know in the 1980s which I was very young at that time just to highlight um, but uh, you we used overhead projectors or rather my father used overhead projectors and acetates kind of those funny plastic screens that you would place on a bed of light and it would project on the wall um, and if you imagine on one sheet you would draw a business transactional process a line with certain touch points and certain events happening at certain stages but I use the analogy of when we're trying to construct a truly user centric approach to, to technology and to automation we need to overlay that with a new acetate which sits over the top of the old process and maybe you know shows a different kind of filter a different viewpoint for example in mobility from the employee perspective what are the things that an employee should think and feel and act and do at certain points along that business transactional process layer on top of that again another of these filters which comes from the managers perspective and I think um, that again tells a slightly different story and, and again reshapes the end automation goals of an organization um, when they begin to think of it from multiple perspectives and lastly of course uh, the HR manager um, perspective and once you look at this from those multiple viewpoints that for me makes truly um, uh, makes true sense when it comes to understanding the user experience now if we could move on please how effective is an organization's talent mobility program at achieving the following following talent objectives of course there are all the classic things that people say we want an individual to expand a professional network we want to create a diverse workforce develop an individual skill set or develop key skill sets and core competences within an organization uh, attracting top talent and that of course links to the final point which is talent retention how do you make people come along and join but then also how do you get them to stay with an organization um, and the one in the middle which is building that leadership pipeline now for me I guess I often see that many organizations do perhaps lack a coherent strategy or and I'll come back to the strategic value of what I consider to mobility to be in, in my final slide the next slide but but I think this this from my own perspective it's really about of course um, developing next generation leaders it's developing an organization that sends the right messages to its employees which is one can have an international experience based not on hierarchy and, and the you know the, the simply assignment of international experience to to senior people but it moves beyond hierarchy into more of a meritocratic um, organization where people achieve it's the equality of opportunity that I talked about before when it comes to the diversity agenda um, and I think truly meritocratic uh, meritocratic organizations stand a much um, better chance of being successful uh, in the long term and of course a key fundamental is this mixed leadership piece it's an absolutely uh, unavoidable fact that particularly in Europe it is coming to many European organizations through national legislation that says that by a certain date you must have a certain quota of female leaders alongside male leaders and if the, those quotas are not met then the position may must remain unfilled and this will hit organizations that are not prepared very 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 hard um, coming back to the attracting top talent and the talent retention well this is where I also think there's a very fundamental link between mobility as an organization and the talent function specifically in the um, EVP employer value proposition uh, area and employer branding um, and I think you know by setting out a stand to the outside world and saying that this is what we stand for this is the power that we believe mobility has to change an organization and we absolutely subscribe to that and saying we want to use mobility both as a way to to get people to come and join our organization and then to stay and grow in our organization I think it sends a very very strong and clear message to an organization uh, to a to a future demographic of potential employees that is probably very hungry for this kind of opportunity and that leads me on to the last slide please Claire from, from my part before I hand over to Bryn satisfaction with talent mobility programs oh dear doesn't look good 0% exceed expectations and only 18% met expectations well I think the first question to ask oneself as a mobility program head and anyone involved in that mobility value chain I should say is really what does value truly look like for your organization and of course that's a very hard thing to dig into it comes back perhaps to my comments earlier about I think the limited success for some organizations of the Ulrich model because it doesn't deliver the organizational impact that you want but it also doesn't deliver the organizational value that you want because uh, you're missing a kind of uh, a deep dialogue between 
local touch points, local business leaders, you miss that thoroughness and, and that deepness of the conversation to then truly begin to shape um, an understanding of what value looks like for an organization. So until you understand what value is for your specific organization, then you will struggle to, of course, exceed expectations uh, unless you take the view of mobility as simply being a transactional process, which I don't. And that leads me on to the final point I'd like to make today. Um, I recently wrote a blog in July this year about the future of mobility for the RES Forum. For, it's all accessible by the RES Forum's website. Um, and I think the moment has come for mobility. Um, it's a big statement. I, I think for a long time mobility functions, relocation functions have, have been the poorer cousin of the, the reward teams or comp and bend teams deemed to have less organizational strategic value. And I think that that analogy has been completely flipped on its head. I think when you look to geocentricity, and I think when you look to uh, organizations developing a truly international uh, or internationalization strategy, then who are the best people to um, to really be the facilitators, the ambassadors of that strategy, to be the, the glue that works between business units functions? Well, it's the mobility team. Um, I feel, you know, I appreciate it's a big statement, but but often I see from my teams in pre in the organisation where I work now and previous organisations, they're multilingual. And when I say multilingual, I'm talking three, four, or five languages. Um, they have all lived and worked abroad. They've got cross-cultural experience, enormous cross-cultural sens sensitivity. Uh, they have got a deep understanding of international business very often, uh, and also a deep passion for, for all things international, so to speak. And I think it's those people that can really help organizations along the way when it comes to internationalizing the strategy of an organization. And that is really what I feel supports um, my bold statement that, that the moment for mobility is now. And on that note, I'll pass over to Bryn. Fantastic. Thanks, David. Claire, can you proceed to the next slide, please? Great. So talent mobility as the last mile of HR technology. So as we talked about with David, there's a number of macro trends sweeping enterprises today. And then there's a number of pillars of a 21st century organization. Uh, we also talked about how there's a clear mobilization that we need different solutions for mobility and that mobility is now an important and critical element of a successful HR organization and a successful talent strategy. What you see in other parts of HR is a great shift toward modern HR technology. You see organizations over the last 10 years buying a lot of HR technology uh, for general HR and talent management processes. You see investors investing in a lot of different innovative HR technologies, but you don't yet see that in talent mobility. And what that means is that many of the talent mobility functions haven't yet had the benefit of the data analytics, the efficiencies, the great employee experience that comes with modern technology. And so we asked folks in the survey, uh, how do they currently use technology to manage talent mobility at their organization? And the statistics are surprising. So 37% of companies still use manual Excel files and emails to manage their global mobility program. This is quite difficult and quite risky given the complexity of, of managing a global mobility program across many countries and many jurisdictions. Similarly, we see that um, you know, for those who do use technology, it's not yet technology that is, is rooted in the cloud and is agile, flexible in the way that uh, HR tech in the cloud is. 28% of companies use on-premise software. Um, and actually, just 28% of companies use cloud technology today to manage their mobility program. Uh, we found this quite surprising, actually, given that the numbers are quite a bit higher in the broader HR space. The interesting thing is that there does seem to be today as we talked about, a clear acknowledgement that global mobility programs and global mobility teams do need to implement some form of technology to scale their programs into the 21st century. 
approximately 41% of respondents uh, do plan to implement some form of technology within the next 12 months. Um, and I think what you're seeing right now is macro trends, the company trends, and the technology trends converging to introduce modern technology to mobility programs. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of changes in the structure of mobility programs, the way that they centralize and analyze data, and the way that they communicate and collaborate with employees, with other departments, and with external vendors through technology as we go forward this year. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there has been a broad acknowledgement across other areas of HR that um, the, the technology really does support best practices across the HR organization. So we've seen recruitment organizations move from RPOs or recruitment process outsourcers to technology products. We've seen um, HR departments implement general human capital management software, and we've seen a proliferation of talent management solutions. Uh, investors also realize this, and many of them are funding the innovation in the HR technology space right now. Uh, interestingly, as you can see on the slide here, startups that offer software for human resources and recruitment have garnered more than $800 million of venture capital funding in the first half of 2015. Um, that is actually significantly larger than any of the prior statistics. Um, and it is that capital, largely from Silicon Valley, that's driving a lot of the innovation in uh, HR technology and systems. Next slide, please. So we think uh, that HR technology will come into the talent mobility space uh, with big guns this year. And as we talked about, our respondents felt the same thing. 41% of them do plan to implement an HR technology system within the next 12 months. So we asked the question as to why that is and how cloud-based HR technology can support talent mobility programs to reduce cost and complexity. And what we see is the responses and the statistics on this slide. So talent mobility practitioners and the folks who responded to our survey across the broader HR organization identified three challenges for their current talent mobility program. Um, those top three challenges are high costs. So 64% of programs identified high costs as one of the top three challenges for their program. The second is compliance risk. So 62% of companies identified compliance risk as one of their top three priorities. And the third is too many points of contact. So 51% of organizations identified too many points of contact as one of the top three challenges for their global mobility program. Now, the interesting thing is implementing HR technology for, for talent mobility has the potential to address all three of these challenges that global mobility programs currently face. So firstly, some of the intelligence behind the technology can enable organizations to reduce costs. It can make it visible how much they're currently spending. It can help them identify areas through the supply chain or through policy optimization where they can uh, deliver cost savings to the business. Um, and it can make, do this in a in usable and easy fashion, an, an engaging user interface that the teams can use to really play with those different variables and make sure that their program is delivering maximum value at the lowest cost for the businesses. Now, Technology also uh, obviously has a lot of potential to centralize data. Um, and a lot of what global mobility practitioners seem to struggle with is uh, the reconciling that data. So centralizing it in spreadsheets, uh, which can then be sent to the tax provider or to other areas of the business, uh, managing the integrity of that data as it flows between different providers, different people, e emails, and different spreadsheets. And technology has the ability to centralize a lot of that data and databases um, 
make it usable uh, for the user in, in an easy and engaging format, and then have it flow through integrations to different systems, different departments across finance, tax, or the other HR systems. Um, and you see similar benefits derived from other HR systems like an Oracle or an SAP or a Workday where all of the different talent data within the organization is centralized in that software. Now the, the thing unique to talent mobility as many of us on this call know is there's a perennial conversation about the many points of contact during a move. Uh, and that's the reality. There's vendors, shipping vendors, temporary accommodation, tax, et cetera. There's different people within the organization that need to communicate with the employee, and there's the employee themselves and their various family members. Now, technology really has the possibility to bring all of those different stakeholders together so that they can share information, they can access the same view of that information, and they can collaborate through a process. Uh, many of us experience similar things when we use technology platforms like Salesforce or, you know, even this WebEx today where we're able to all come together through a technology platform and share information and communicate and collaborate. And that's one of the big areas of potential that we see for technology and talent mobility. Now, I think broadly the survey respondents and certainly other people in the market that I personally know and have spoken to acknowledge that there's a big opportunity for uh, technology platforms to reduce cost and complexity for their programs, but not everyone is adopting them. Um, and certainly that statistic of 41% of programs planning to implement new technology, you know, that's not 100%. Um, so we wanted to investigate what are the three biggest inhibitors for not using technology for talent mobility today? And what the respondents uh, said was that the three biggest inhibitors are number one, cost. So 31% of respondents identified the high cost of technology as an inhibitor for adoption. Number two, lack of support from senior management. So 26% of respondents identified lack of support from senior management as an inhibitor to purchasing and adopting technology for talent mobility. And number three, difficulty with implementation. So 21% of respondents identified difficulty with implementation as a reason for not adopting talent mobility technology. Now the interesting thing is if we go back a slide and we look at the um, use of on-premise software versus cloud software, we see something interesting. So cloud software solves uh, point one and point two. It's much cheaper, a much cheaper cost, total cost of ownership than a traditional on-premise model. Uh, generally, the implementation is very limited. Uh, it can be very quick for the organization. So organizations are able to solve some of those inhibitors today. And with cloud technology and with some of the benefits that it can bring in, in cost savings to the program and in reducing compliance risks and in centralizing those contact points, we see talent mobility teams being able to come up with a cohesive business case to present to senior management to get their buy-in for purchase. And that's a critical part of adopting talent mobility technology is creating that business case Present and presenting it internally for buy-in. Next slide, please. So the next slide calls out a interesting statistic that came out through the survey. You'll see 94% of respondents said that technology would in some way help them meet business and talent objectives. I pause for dramatic effect because any senior executive is interested in this. If technology helps meet business objectives and helps meet talent objectives, these are, as David talked about, two of the top things on the agenda of the C-suite and the agenda of a global organization today. So we all seem aligned on the fact that this is beneficial for our 21st century organization. Next slide, please. 
And so then the question becomes, what are the key benefits of cloud technology? And how do we start to think about that business case for technology for talent mobility? Well, we identified through the survey and through our research five benefit themes. Um, and I want to talk through those today. So the first is that cloud technology helps global mobility departments align. So it helps align talent mobility and talent management um, with employee engagement. So that's through data on uh, people's career paths, that's through success rates in the technology, that's through all of the different analytics capabilities that can exist within cloud technology. And I think this is kind of the holy grail for an organization's talent, global talent strategy today. How do we align talent management data with global mobility data, um, with retention and churn data to map people's career paths and do some predictive analytics around that? Um, by bringing together your talent management system and your talent mobility system, that actually becomes a reality. The second benefit that we identified through the research is that cloud technology for talent mobility helps streamline program management, opening up the team to focus on high, what we call higher alpha work. So a lot of the respondents today are quite busy with program administration, filling out forms, reconciling data and spreadsheets, responding to emails, calling vendors to check in on the progress of various things. And that's not what we call higher alpha work. That's not being a part of the strategic talent discussions. That's not talking about the alignment of talent mobility and talent management. That's administration. And so if we put that administration into an engine for talent mobility into a, a software platform, that empowers the team to be a part of of the strategic conversations and the higher alpha work. The third benefit is that cloud technology helps centralize information for better decision making. So we talked about this in the compliance point and in the strategy point. So the critical point here is that today a lot of data about a talent mobility program is disparate. It is fragmented across different P&Ls, different systems, different emails, and different vendors. And obviously, it's quite a project to pull all of that together. So what a cloud technology system does is it actually holds all of that data so that the team can access that data and they can use that for business decisions about, about expansion, for talent decisions about particular employees, and to ensure that they are making decisions in line with their compliance obligations. The fourth benefit from cloud technology is that it helps organizations collaborate across global stakeholders. Now we already talked about this, it, this in the prior slide, so I won't go into much detail, but as I said, it's critical in talent mobility in particular to bring together all of the different stakeholders within the ecosystem, both internally within the organization as well as externally with the different vendors who support an employee move and that particular employee and their family. If they can all communicate across a platform, if they can all access the same information across that platform, if they all receive the same updates, then a lot of the manual back and forth, a lot of the phone calls, um, and a lot of the things that really frustrate our employees and our assignees and our business partners are taken away. The last benefit of cloud technology that we identified is access to financial data to identify cost savings and ensure compliance. Um, this is really about providing, again, the um, information for better decision making, uh, as we talked about in the third pillar. Um, but this is specific to finance data. Um, what, what I think we often see in talent mobility programs today is there's requests from finance, there's requests about how much is being spent, there's requests to make that at a, a very granular level, but it's actually very difficult to do that. So what we see cloud technology being able to do is very much bridge that gap between talent mobility and finance to run some of the finance analytics and inform and empower the conversations that need to happen between the HR organization and the finance organization. Next slide, please. And so finally, how do we deliver better talent mobility programs with technology? And 
do the survey respondents support that? So 86% of our respondents agreed that technology enables greater access to real-time data and analytics. And I think we all agree that that's a critical part of empowering the mobility team for their strategic conversations and to do the job effectively. 76% of respondents agreed that they're too much, they're much more able to manage compliance risks with technology. Um, again, one of the most important things that a global mobility program does is to make sure that they're moving employees within the compliance regime. And technology makes that a much simpler process. Thirdly, 76% of respondents agreed that administrative tasks have been greatly reduced through cloud platforms. So those organizations that do use cloud technology to manage their program, we're in agreement that those platforms demonstrably improved the administration of their program. Fourthly, 69% of respondents agreed that they have a much better handle on cost control for programs with technology. And finally, 51% of respondents said that too many points of contact is the biggest challenge with their mobility program. So you'll see that these five statistics give us the proof in the pudding. Organizations and our survey respondents as a reflection of them believe that cloud technology has the ability to dramatically improve programs and has the ability to bring the organization into the 21st century um, aligned with many of the macro themes and the company themes that, that David talked about. Next slide, please. And so in conclusion, what I would love to see is all of us work together to move mobility into the 21st century and to increase that 0% of programs who said that their program exceeded expectations to greater than 50%. I think we can do that. I think we can do that with purchasing and implementing cloud technology, with wrapping around best-in-class service for our signees and our, our other parts of our organization with that technology, and really highlight all of the work and all of the successes that the Global Mobility Organization has. So I look forward to, uh, to taking some questions now along with David. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to Claire to moderate the questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Bryn and David. Um, I hope all agree that was a fantastic webinar. Very interesting. So we do have a few questions from the people on the webinar. David, the first one is actually for you. As a mobility professional, how would you translate what you found in the survey to your day-to-day? -day? Interesting question. Um, I already am. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I work for German um, sporting goods manufacturers. They're head of mobility, and, and also a second part of my job is reward innovation. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, very much seeking ways to to drive HR automize, or automation is fundamental because it frees up my team to be the technical experts that I that, that we have to be for for the organisation. Uh, so it's really an organisational efficiency thing. Um, of course, you know we want to manage compliance in such a way through an automated process so that I think you know many of the tax providers are are really acknowledging the shift in in the compliance landscape at the moment from being uncompliant until you're caught and then having to fix everything to working with authorities around the world to set up much more automated systems to ensure regular compliance to again it removes one piece of that worry from the pie um, the uh, on the, the 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 policy side and the flexibility of policy and the total rewards piece I think that's an absolute fundamental it's you know part of my work at the moment is figuring out for my for my daytime employer um, is really as well as managing a very complex global program is defining the future in terms of this digital nomad concept that I that I touched upon and lastly is an extremely strong and, and, and beneficial partnership that I have with uh, the talent function uh, specifically focusing on how we attract people uh, how we you know bring people to the group and then make them want to first of all join and subsequently st uh, stay and of course that's a, uh, one of one of the five brand pillars of the organization that I work for here in Germany is around 
the prospect of an international career. We call it uh, the the globe trotter career, um, and and uh, a very strong alliance when it comes to developing and, and delivering that brand message. So it's already in effect. The the, the ball is already rolling, so to speak. Great. Thank you, David. Um, we have another question. This one is for Bryn. How are you foreseeing reducing the number of contacts when there are so many different areas that are subject matter experts to consider? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I think that's one of definitely one of the challenges for just mobility as, as, as an area. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing is that I think historically we've had a lot of dialogue about the single point of contact, and that's something that has been talked about a lot in the market. Um, but I think the concept of collaboration is a bit different than that, specifically with all of those different areas of expertise. I don't, I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a single point of contact or a single expert. I think it's a, a bit of a, um, a pipe dream. Um, it's impossible for someone to have all of those expertise or for a single company to have all of that expertise. But I think what cloud technology does is it allows the different experts to come together to support an individual move. And so that's exactly what we're talking about here is not necessarily saying, okay, there's only one person involved in this, but acknowledging that mobility requires a lot of different elements of expertise and it touches a lot of different pieces of knowledge and pieces of the organization and external vendors. And the platform allows all of them to come together to communicate with the employee, to communicate with their family, and to communicate with the organization. Um, and probably lastly, to communicate with each other so that there's seamless information sharing and centralization of that data that the team can use to uh, inform their internal conversations. Thank you, Bren. So this is a question actually directed to both of you. Um, Bren, do you want to start? It's what about the survey surprised you the most? Sure. You know, I think you know there can be there's a number of different surveys that that often show that um, mobility teams or broader business leaders uh, see room for improvement with programs. But I was actually shocked that um, just 18 percent of the survey respondents said that their program met their expectations, and actually that 0% of them said that their program exceeded expectations. I actually can't believe that we live in an era where we have the macro trends that David mentioned, the pillars of the 21st century organization that David mentioned, and we have a broad acknowledgement that mobility is not necessarily positioned for the 21st century. Um, and I think it's great that we recognize that because now as an industry, we can figure out what that means and what the solutions are. Um, but I was actually shocked by that component of the responses. Yeah, thanks, Bryn. I would just add to that a couple of things, I guess. First of all, um, it's the, uh, the, the, the the how effective is an organization's talent mobility program at achieving the following talent objectives. Similar to what you said, it's this kind of lack of coherent strategy um, and the, the lack of understanding of, uh, you know, what value looks like, what success looks like perhaps for a particular organization. And that really brings me back to, um, you know, the topic that I touched upon, which is the discrepancy between the relative importance of virtual meetings and then the actual effectiveness, which was much, much lower. And it, and it again brings me back to this point around collaboration and how does an organization collaborate internally. Again, we acknowledge that there's lots of external touch points uh, from you know vendors, as you just talked about, Bryn. Um, one thing I, I should probably add to that is it's not just about plugging external vendors into a system. It's very much about aligning external vendors to deliver collectively on an organization strategy whilst at the same time having a deep understanding of an organization and a client's culture. And I think that then gives everyone a stake in the co-creation of a, of, a, of, a, of a great employee experience, which is of what, what of course, we all seek to deliver. But coming back to the, the question, which is the thing that surprised me, is this lack of collaboration. Um, uh, and it brings me back to the point I made about the the limitations of the Ulrich model in terms of delivering organizer understanding what organizational value is and and ensuring true global impact of the mobility function and that for me is the alarming piece. 
Thank you, David. So that concludes our webinar for today. Just so everybody knows, we will share the slides as well as the webinar recording of the